Hey everyone, it is Adam and Akbar, as usual, coming at you for our seventh lecture in Philosophy 2600, Ethics and Science. This will be our last lecture in our module on ethics, and it's the third in our three-part series looking at the different kinds of ethics. We did, what did we do? Cloning and descriptive ethics, relativism and meta-ethics. Now we're looking at animals and normative ethics with a particular focus on Peter Singer's article that you're reading. Here's what I want to do in this video, is hopefully get us to learn something about normative ethics, although that's just going to be one slide. And I really want us to focus on utilitarianism and this utilitarian case for animal rights. And then at the end, we'll have a couple of criticisms of that case. So that's what I want you to take away, is kind of better standing of normative ethics, uh, particularly the utilitarian theory, and how we can apply that to animals and the moral standing of animals, that is, or the moral status of animals, and then how we might go about critiquing that. Um, a lot of what I'm saying is in the, uh, the reading, the chapter from our textbook, and it's probably, I should say, I teach ethical theory every once in a while. We would do, whole, we'd do a whole semester on utilitarianism, right? So we're only going to be kind of covering the surface, and I hope to say helpful things that give you a sense of the big picture here. So we'll start with normative ethics. I have just a tad on Peter Singer. Then we're going to spend more time on utilitarianism. Uh, we'll, I'll say a word about Singer's argument uh, in the article that you're reading. And then I just have a slide on a deontological criticism and a slide on an ethics of care criticism. Um, just so you don't walk away thinking that Peter Singer has the final word on the moral standing of animals and that utilitarianism is the only perspective, far from it. It's just what we're focusing on today because it is an important perspective. Okay, this is kind of a reminder. Also, again, this is in the, in the textbook. Normative ethics and normative ethical theories, what are they and what do they do? Well, they're there to explain what makes an act or, in a, situ or a situation right or wrong or good or bad. Put it a different way. Normative ethical theories provide ways of thinking through ethical dilemmas and developing well-reasoned arguments for making choices. So they tell you, they have a way of directing your attention and developing a certain moral vocabulary for explaining what makes something good, bad, what makes it right or wrong which way we should go and which way we shouldn't go, it provides a way of thinking that through and giving you some direction, at least in theory. And ideally, that's what these normative ethical theories do. Recall, we mentioned there are four main uh, normative ethical theories, consequentialism, and utilitarianism is the main species of consequentialism. So we'll focus on utilitarianism, but I just wanted you to know it's also part of the bigger, fancier word consequentialism, which just tells you what makes something right or wrong is its consequences, right? And utilitarianism has a way of cashing out consequences in terms of utility, which is really just happiness. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and then there's deontology, virtue ethics, and ethics of care or feminism, which is a bit more of a nebulous grab bag, uh, but we talked about how these center relationships as morally important. So in this lesson, we're gonna talk about Peter Singer's, uh, but we're really just gonna focus on utilitarianism. Okay, you should know uh, at least a little bit that Peter Singer is probably um, the most famous and influential living moral philosopher or ethicist. Um, this is, I just pulled off his Wikipedia page, and you all can do your own biographical searches, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But this is a very important voice in contemporary ethical theory. But more than that, an important voice in uh, sociocultural criticisms. Uh, he's a prominent public intellectual who has weighed in on very important issues and provides a, um, I think, a, a usually a well reasoned, well grounded, persuasive argument for what's the right thing to do when it comes to issues like poverty and the treatment of animals and many, many other things. Uh, he's a very intelligent, well-spoken, articulate public intellectual. It's not to say you have to agree with him, 
but I think whenever he speaks, it's worth paying attention to because he's a very thoughtful person. So it's important to, I think, read some of his stuff, know a little bit about him. Um, okay, he's a utilitarian. What does that mean? So I've got this slide. Utilitarians believe that an act is right or wrong according to its consequences. Remember, it's a version of consequentialism. The good is prior to the right. That just means that's fancy, maybe, well, not really fancy, but a little bit cryptic uh, ethical theory talk. It just means that right actions are those that produce the most good. An act is right, and that's not a typo there, that IFF just means if and only if. So an act is right if and only if it is reasonably expected to produce the greatest balance of good or the least balance of harm. And so the early utilitarian theorists would talk about doing a moral calculus, basically. So the ethical life, moral reasoning, is essentially doing a form of calculus where you add up the benefits of a proposed action and the costs, and you balance them out, and you pick the one that has the greatest balance of good. You know? Well, what is the good? Well, it's happiness, but this gets really murky. What do we mean by that? Um, I won't have a lot of time to talk about it in, in particular here. And each person, or I put parenthetically creatures, because utilitarianism is not limited to just thinking humans have moral standing, as we know from Peter Singer's article. Everybody's happiness counts the same. So there's this commitment to equality, and there's this commitment to waiting consequences of actions based on how they impact happiness, overall happiness. John Stuart Mill, the great formulator of utilitarianism, uh, following in the footsteps of really in many ways the originator, Jeremy Bentham. Mill put it this way, he said, actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness, i.e. pleasure or absence of pain. So that's the way he talked about happiness or utility is happiness is pleasure. Disutility, what would be wrong, is the opposite of happiness, which would be pain. Um, but Mill was actually much more nuanced than, than, than that might lead on to. But this is a good kind of concrete way of thinking about the principle of utility. So basically, look, you do a moral calculus, you do a cost-benefit assessment, right? There's Jeremy Bentham, okay, this is, uh, you, should, you should look this up, but I, my understanding is that he, um, when he was going, formulating his will, he applied consistently his ideas of utilitarianism, and he decided it would be the greatest benefit to uh, use his embalmed body for um, inspiring uh, future generations of students at his university. And so I think the plan was to have him basically propped up somewhere in the college. Um, and even after a while, they just had his head. I don't know if you dare to see, but between his legs there, this is actually just a, like a wax figure or something, but that was his actual head. I don't think it's there anymore. And uh, this is stuff I'm getting from Michael Sandel, who's another prominent uh, philosopher and public intellectual. Rumor had it that the students used to break into this thing and take the head and play soccer with it. I don't know if that's true, but maybe that was for the greatest good, right? So maybe he did his uh, philosophic calculus, right? His happiness calculus uh, as a good utilitarian will do. I put this picture of happy pills here just to get you thinking that uh, if ha is happiness really what matters? If you could just take a pill and be happy no matter what, you know? If everybody could just be on happy pills and be happy all the time, would that actually be a good outcome? On the surface, it looks like that would be what utilitarians would prescribe, but that could be kind of actually dystopian and weirdly nightmarish, just food for thought. Okay, um, central questions utilitarianism. So you want to be a utilitarian. Here are some things you're going to have to think through to make your theory work. What are you going to mean by good and harm? So you're committed to saying that, look, the, what makes an action right is its consequences and when the consequences of it are good and they, they're maximized or they outweigh the harm. 
But what do you mean by those terms, right? So is good just pleasure? Are all pleasures equally good? Isn't there other, aren't there other goods other than pleasures? How would you weigh different kinds of goods? What do you mean by harm? Is it just pain? Because, you know, there is productive pain, right? Uh, like working out at the gym, for example, that can be a good pain. So these are things for utilitarians to think about, and they argue with each other all the time about this stuff. Whose interests are you taking into account? For example, Singer says, animals. So this another way of putting this question is who has or what has moral status or moral considerability? What needs to be taken into account when you do your calculus of costs and benefits and consequences, right? How then, when you look at these interests that you're taking into account, how are you gonna measure them? How are you gonna aggregate them and compare them across individuals? This is fodder for endless debates, both theoretical and very practical in government policies, for example, about how to evaluate the consequences of any decision. Because you've got all these interests that are impacted and they seem to be incommensurable. That is, there's no way to measure them against each other, yet you have to do that if you're a utilitarian. And then my little bar is blocking me. Okay, well, oh, the big criticism and we'll get to this towards the end of utilitarianism is it does not factor in individual rights. I mean, my goodness, what if uh, you throw a few Christians to the lions? This is a classic example. And sure, they suffer horribly, right? But there's a whole arena full of people who derive great pleasure and happiness from seeing these Christians eaten by the lions. Well, at least on the face of it, it looks like utilitarians would be willing to say, hmm, Maybe that is the right thing to do. You know, as long as the happiness of the many outweighs the pain of the few. That's a big point of contention and something you would have to think through if you're a utilitarian. And it's a reason I think a lot of people aren't at least consistent utilitarians all the time, maybe. Here's just a fun case study, uh, the Ford Pinto, before even I was uh, paying attention to this stuff. So if you're a utilitarian, and by the way, most government sort of policy analysis is basically cost-benefit analysis. Utilitarianism is a very practical, widely used moral theory. Um, one of the things you have to figure out is how are you going to value the life of people in your calculations about infrastructure that we're building and products that we're making and regulating, right? So this Fort Pintos had these exploding gas tanks when there'd be a rear collision. It was a defect. Ford knew about the problem and they performed a cost benefit assessment, CBA, to see if it would be cost effective to install a shield on the tank to increase safety. Okay, so here's what their CBA looked like. And this is something I'm getting from Michael Sandell again. So costs of repairing, so installing that shield so the gas tank doesn't blow up. It would be $11 per part and you had 12 and a half million of these things out there, grand total, 137 million. Uh, yeah, that about checks out. I think I did the math right. You can double check me there. What about the benefits though? Well, you would avoid 180 deaths. Now in courts, when somebody had an accident and they sued Ford, it would cost Ford about $200,000 for a death. 180 injuries would be avoided and that cost them in the courts about $67,000 per injury. And you'd have 2,000 vehicles that wouldn't need replacement, and other 2,000 vehicles that aren't going to blow up on you, right? Um, but you add all that up, it's only $49.5 million. So you could say it's cheaper to just let these cars blow up and then pay off the families who lost somebody. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now you, you might be thinking, well, that's not the right thing to do. But that's how the numbers add up. So you could say, look, this is a bad version of utilitarianism because they're not taking into account all the things that should be taken into account, or they're not properly valuing the things that are at stake, or they're not weighing and balancing those values correctly, right? So you can salvage utilitarianism. But it does often present um, consequences from your calculus that don't seem to be intuitively the right thing to do. Now that's interesting when it comes to normative theory, you can check them with your intuitions and you can say that can't be right. But then again, they should also be checks on your intuitions because your intuitions arguably are not informed by theoretical reasoning. So what should we trust? Our kind of gut feel 
or the moral calculus that we just ran through, right? How do we um, bring those into what some call reflective equilibrium? Here's another fun one, uh, Edward Thorndike, uh, early mid 20th century educational psychologist at Columbia, I think. And he said, um, he kind of surveyed people, you know, good kind of uh, descriptive ethics, social science. How much would you, how much would you have to be paid to get one of your teeth pulled out or a little toe cut off or to eat a worm? Or he said to live the rest of your life on a farm in Kansas or to choke a stray cat to death with your bare hands. He had other questions too. I asked my wife, how much would, would somebody have to pay you to eat a worm? And she went, mm, I said, 20 bucks? And she said, no, no way. 200? Mm-mm, mm-mm. 2,000? Oh yeah, <laughs> I, knew it. I need a worm for 2,000. So, you know, here's his point is that look, Ethics is kind of objective and measurable. It's, it's all about human wants, desires, pleasures, right? And trying to avoid pains. And you can measure these things. So it's like a science. So life just consists of these appetites, desires, cravings, and the gratifications. It's complex with humans, but still we could figure out ways to measure these things and weigh them against each other. Because you can transfer them into dollars, right? And then that becomes your way of comparing different values. So just look at people's willingness to pay and look at their revealed preferences, how much they actually do pay for things like a, like a vacation to a ski resort. And then you can figure out the right answer to moral questions like what should we do with this land? Should we make it a national park or an amusement park? Well, just tabulate what are people willing to pay that tells you what they find valuable. And if they're willing to pay more to go and enjoy an amusement park, well then, sorry, Yosemite, we're, we're chucking another Disney World in there, right? So, things for you to think about. Does this capture ethics for you? Can everything be rendered in, in dollar signs, right? And if not, what does that say about utilitarianism? Also, what does it say practically about how are you gonna make decisions if you can't boil everything down to some standard universal currency like dollars how do we compare competing wants and interests and desires? Okay, I'm gonna fudge here. Look, I put the outline, uh, my outline for Singer's argument in the notes. So I'm not actually gonna walk through it in this lecture. I think it's pretty crystal clear in the notes. And of course you gotta read it on your own. And I'm really not gonna be doing those outlines probably the rest of the semester because one of the things you wanna learn, I'm just trying to model that for you. I'm hoping to challenge you to become a kind of more critical, deeper reader by using these note-taking techniques when you uh, are reading articles as we go along. So that's in there for you, but I know you can look through that. So let's not waste our airtime. What do you think, Akbar? Yeah, he's all for it. So then let's just wrap up with two criticisms of Singer's article. So you've read it, you've outlined it, you kind of know what he's saying. Um, do, you do you find it persuasive? Now, the two, are, the two criticisms I'm going to point out are not people who want you to treat animals worse. Okay? Your one criticism a singer would, you could imagine would be, nah, we should keep eating cows. Okay? No, both of these critics think we should treat animals much better than we do. So in that sense, they all three agree. Okay? They all want to stand up for animal welfare, animal rights. But they all have different reasons for why. Okay? In other words, they have different normative theories. Tom Regan will be our stand-in for deontology. And this is what he says. He says, you know what's wrong with, with the status quo of factory farming and using animals and, and research? It's not the pain and suffering, it's rather that the system allows us to use, to view, and to use animals as our resources here for us. They're just, they're purely instrumentally valuable as if they don't have intrinsic worth of their own. That's what's wrong, Regan says. It's not about pain and suffering. It's about what kinds of beings have intrinsic worth and value. That's a deontological way of thinking about ethics because it's almost like it doesn't matter what the consequences are. If a being has intrinsic value, there's certain things you simply cannot do to or with that creature, period, right? That's kind of his line of thinking. 
Animals, he says, are experiencing subjects of a life. They have this subjective sense of what they like to do in life. They have intrinsic value as a result of that, and you can't just chuck them in a cage, right? Now, on his view, let me move my little bar here, it gets in the way. Um, the only way we can prevent a kind of abhorrent moral calculus where we imprison and use animals um, is his way, right? In other words, Singer, he wants to say Singer would be okay with a little bit of a nice cushier cage for the pig, right? Give him some nice uh, straw. Give the chicken a little bit more room to spread its wings out, right? In other words, it's not suffering. You know, it's not feeling any pain. Just keep it in a cage, raise it there. It's having a nice life. And then whammo, one day you knock it over the head and you kill it and you eat it. There's no pain or suffering involved, right? But Regan wants to say that is still an immoral system because you are caging this creature and you're using it sheerly for its instrumental value, okay? So he, in a way, is much more radical than Singer. He wants to abolish, for example, industrial agriculture. Whereas you could say Singer might be okay with just making it a little bit kinder and gentler, you know? So that's one uh, criticism that we could throw out there. Last one to look at, this is from Cora Diamond. Fantastic essay that I sometimes teach, but I'm not this semester, but it's called Eating Meat and Eating People. Find it out there if you want to, or send me a note if you want me to send you a version of it. Um, it's just a fantastic uh, article. And she criticizes both Singer and Regan. She says they don't convince anyone. I mean, look, you read the, the Singer. Are you going to stop eating hamburgers? You know, if, if you do. I know some of you are vegetarians already. Um, my experience is most students like, no, nah. <laughs> you know, I get a good argument, but it doesn't persuade me. Why? Well, Diamond says, because both Singer and Regan operate from this impartial or abstract view. They're looking at animals and they're trying to abstract away from that living being some property that is then the morally salient property. Like it's a creature that experiences pain or it is an, it is an experiencing subject of a life. That's too abstract to move people, right? Ethics has got to be about appealing to our emotive infrastructure so that we actually feel with and sympathize with these creatures, right? So in other words, Regan and Singer don't want us to be speciesist. But Diamond says, actually, we in a way should be very speciesist. We should humanize animals. We should try to see them as one of us. Okay? This is a whole different way of thinking about ethics uh, in animals. It's a different normative ethic. It's what I've been calling an ethics of, of care because it prioritizes relationships. Look, what she's saying is we're constituted by our relationships and the practices we share. We are who we are because we're moms, we're daughters, we're dads, we're sons, we're coworkers, we're friends, right? This is what makes us who we are. And we share birthdays together, weddings, funerals, graduation ceremonies, right? We share meals with each other around the table. Um, this is what makes us a part of a moral community. It makes us human. It makes us things, she says, that we don't eat, right? That's why it's called eating meat and eating humans. Humans aren't the things we eat. Why is that? Because we're, we're uncles and aunts, right? It's not what you do with uncles and aunts. So these relationships confer on us moral worth and value. And if you want animals to have that moral worth and value, you've got to develop those kinds of relationships with them. So to treat animals better, you have to see them as what she calls a fellow creature. You have to see yourself. You have to build that relationship with that creature. In other words, think of pets. That's a great example she uses. Your pet has a name. That's a way we become a human, right? I don't know if you've ever read uh, Charles Dickens' novels, uh, his, his depictions of these early capitalist, you know, mustache twiddling overlords who just dehumanized people around them. He thought it'd be 
with this one named Gradgrind. Thought it would be easier to just call her girl number 20, right? Why do I have to remember unique names for everybody? You're number 20, you're number 21, right? Well, that's dehumanizing. We have a name. Well, pets have names, right? Pets share in our life world. So we treat them really well, okay? If we wanna treat animals well, start seeing them all more like pets or more like humans, more like fellow creatures, right? So anyways, I know that's just glossing over it, but hopefully you get a sense of here's utilitarianism. Here it is applied to the moral standing of animals. And then here are different ways of thinking about that, even ways that agree on the outcome they wanna get, which is better treatment of animals. They dif disagree on what are the good reasons to get us there because they've got different normative ethical theories going on, right? Okay, going on too long. Akbar channeling the spirit of Peter Singer says, look, don't be a speciesist, dude. And on that note, fellow humanoids, until next time, may the force be with you.